Welcome to the Modern Husbands Podcast, where any combination of Dr. Bruce Ross, Christian Sherrill, and Brian Page host national experts who share winning ideas to manage money in the home as a team. Eve Rodsky transformed a blueberry's breakdown into a catalyst for social change when she applied her Harvard-trained background in organizational management to ask the simple yet profound question, what would happen if we treated our homes as our most important organizations? Her New York Times bestselling book and Reese Witherspoon's book club pick, Fair Play, is a gamified life management system that helps partners rebalance their domestic workload and reimagine their relationship. Her book was also the inspiration for the Apple TV documentary, Fair Play. Eve Rodsky received her BA in economics and anthropology from the University of Michigan and her JD from Harvard Law School. Today, we will discuss how you can use the Fair Play system to manage your home as a team with your partner. Eve, Christian, and I feel like we're meeting a superstar here. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. I feel the same. I, I, I really believe the next frontier of this movement in terms of just, you know, equity in the home is really men. And so I really appreciate um, your willingness to talk with me today. Well, we want to begin the podcast with the end in mind. So inspired by your book, which by the way, we, we read, um, the Fair Play documentary was released in the past year and it's been wildly popular. It's available on Apple TV and it walks viewers through the common challenges that couples face managing the home together, particularly homes where both spouses work. And what I found most interesting was the feedback from the husbands at the end of the documentary. Uh, can you start by sharing what they had to say? Okay, Brian and Christian, and you'll know this too. Literally any man that I've spoken to, and we're talking, you know, thousands and thousands of men at this point uh, in 16, maybe even 17 different countries. There's never been anybody mm. who said to me, I regret investing in my family. I regret investing time to figure out my home organization. I regret trading assumptions for structured decision-making. There's never been anybody who's ever said that, right? Even this one systems analyst who I love from a big, you can just imagine sort of a big car company that deals with lots of systems, um, which you can imagine. Uh, he's a systems analyst. And he said to me that as a systems analyst, his home was one where literally every night they were waiting to decide who's taking the dog out right when it was about to take a piss on the rug. And he's a systems analyst. And he said, I don't actually understand how I was having as a systems analyst, which is somebody who creates processes so you don't have to make the same decision every single day was making the same decision every single day, right? And that was sort of his pre-fair play life. So I wanna just start with that big picture, this idea that when you invest in your home, like I said, I've never seen one man, whether he's married to another man, married to a woman in a polyamorous relationship even. I have men who are in polyamorous relationships who tell me they play fair play. I've never seen one, one man say to me that they regret that investment. Wow. Wow. And so as, as you're, as you're sharing this, um, I guess what comes to mind is, you know, my, my feelings, because, um, I was, if you've seen the, the, the documentary or you've read the book, there's a story in there about the blueberries and, um, let's, let's lead with that. Eve, if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about that, because that's, I was the husband on the other end, um, 20 years ago. Can you share, um, just a little bit about, you know, kind of like what prompted this? Yes. Well, Brian, I'm sure that you can agree in Christian. Um, no one sets out to be an expert on the gender division of labor. I don't think, Brian, that when you are at your third grade, what do you want to be when you grow up bored? That you would said, you know, creator of an organization that's trying to like right the wrongs of the gender division of labor. I feel the same way. That wasn't like on my third grade. What do you want to be when you grow up bored? Um, but as life happens, right, um, things that you think are going to be there for you, whether it's just inherent fair partnerships, um, you have values, which is that you want to support your loved ones. We have internal values. And then all of a sudden, one day you wake up and you say, wait, I'm not living those values. 
And so for me, the breakdown was after my second son, Ben, was born, where um, my husband, Seth, and I talk about this in the, in the book, sent me a text, right? From his perspective, probably completely innocuous. Um, I'm surprised you didn't get blueberries. But I think, Brian, you can, as you, as someone who's evolved, right? When mm -hmm. you are a woman who has just had a second child and you get a text like that, I'll tell you what happened to me. What happened to me was that I looked around as I was getting this text where I saw that I had a breast pump on the passenger seat of my car. I had gift, a gift for the newborn baby to return in the back seat of my car. I had taken a step back in my career and started my own law firm for flexibility. So I had a client contract in my lap that I was trying to mark up while I was racing to get my older son from a toddler transition program that lasts in America, you know, 10 minutes and costs like a million dollars. And in the midst of this chaos, Seth sends me this text that literally took the breath away from me. Um, so I pulled over, which you don't do lightly in LA because of traffic. And I just started to cry. I started to sob in my car, thinking to myself, how did I get here? How did I become the fulfiller of my husband's smoothie needs? Like that's literally where we were in our relationship, where I felt like I was the fulfiller of my husband's smoothie needs. But Brian, I need to explain the context because then you, of course, from your perspective, right? A lot of men will say, obviously Seth, didn't know he was triggering this massive, you know, breakdown in our marriage based on his text message. But the context was um, after my second son, my workplace was also abandoning me because they were making it very hard for me to come back after my maternity leave. They weren't offering me flexibility. This is pre pandemic you know, where this was an in-office culture. They weren't offering me a place to pump, you know, breast milk. They were saying maybe they could get me a broom closet without an outlet. So I felt very abandoned by my workplace. And then on top of it, when I went to that toddler transition program, the name tag that I was given was Zach's mom. <laughs> this was a school that told me they were going to know me and support me. And they didn't even know my fucking name. They were calling me Zach's mom. And then on top of that, now I have a husband who also I felt like was abandoning me to the assumptions that somehow I was going to still be the one to take care of the kids, get the flexibility to my work, buy his blueberries. And so that three-part abandonment of sort of my identity to my community as Zach's mom, my workplace making things so difficult for me, plus Seth and his assumptions about what type of work, unpaid work I should be doing for the family. Brian, that was what was the perfect storm that allowed me to start thinking about a different way to live, whether that was going to be divorce, whether that was going to be saying to Seth, I need to do something different. But that breakdown was the beginning of, I would say, the second part of my marriage. The, the reason that I wanted you to share that after sharing the fact that the men who you work with at the conclusion will always say that they are thankful is because I was a Seth and I was working mm -hmm. 60 to 80 hours a week. And I looked at my role simply as to be the provider, despite right. the fact at the time that, you know, hope worked. Um, it was a, you know, the, the typical generational norm of a flexible schedule. And so on my mind, it's like she takes care of the home and I bring home the bacon with zero regard for what she was experiencing with the challenges of what it takes to, to maintain a home. And, you know, fast forward to today where now I'm the one who's managing most of the home tasks, gladly so, um, I feel horrible that I would ever diminish the work that she was doing to make sure that our family was happy and running and not just diminish it, but not even recognize it because I hadn't experienced it myself. And, and throughout this journey from being, you know, what Seth was going through with you to where I am now, uh, I want to just make sure that our listeners understand 
that I am a much happier as a person, as a father, as a husband, now that I have a heavy hand in helping run the home because I can see the smile on my wife's face as mm. she too has a career. She's aspirational and she feels liberated in part because she now has the mind space to devote to working outside of the home. And she feels like that she's not carrying that total burden that, that we're a team. And so if you're a, if you're a listener, understand that, you know, what we're trying to help you do will make not only your wife happier or, or your husband, um, but it will also make you happier. I remember watching the movie when I was a teenager, The Hours. Do y'all mm -hmm. remember this movie? Oh, yes, kind of, yes. It's a meditation on like uh, Virginia Woolf uh, and, and her books, uh, sp especially Mrs. Dalloway, which is something that, you know, we were reading in my high school English class. And there was this scene where the sort of prototypical 1950s, uh, you know, husband comes uh, home to the sort of cookie cutter ranch style house. And the uh, the wife in the couple is there at home with the expectation that, you know, everything is settled. Dinner is ready, cheerful, you know, uh, perfume and makeup, you know, on point. And the husband comes home with a, a bouquet of flowers in this scene. And then he, you know, sort of shuts down when, uh, you know, his, his wife doesn't sort of like heap praise on him and thank him infinitely for what, you know, what a thoughtful gesture about the flowers. Um, and it just occurred to me when, when you were describing um, this sort of epiphany um, and, and kind of turning point, Eve, that, um, you know, a, a lot of us are working uh, you know, a lot of men specifically are working to not to not be the guy with the flowers, right, you know, but right. rather to be be someone who uh, who equitably divides these things and and uh, you know uh, honors the teamwork that it, it takes to have a successful relationship and marriage. So, just grateful for your guidance in in that, uh, Eve. Can you can you walk us through, um, you know, basically how? Uh, fair play works, you know, the system, how it breaks down? Absolutely. Um, so my early beta testers, so after the blueberries break down, um, I started to research this issue, right? So for those who've never heard these terms, um, the, the blueberries breakdown does have a name. Uh, it's called invisible work. It's called uh, emotional labor. Um, it's called the mental load. Um, and so I, I want to sort of explain what doesn't work first, Christian, and then we can talk about what, what does work. So what doesn't work is having a helper, right? So again, I did not find men. Why Fair Play is such a love letter to men. I didn't find men who ever said, like, I don't, I want to be the flowers guy. Like, I, I always, always, there is a openness, you know, but typically the openness looks like, well, if she just would not spend time on unnecessary things and tell me what to do, then I can help. So those things um, were in my mind too, before I understood what it took to actually write the ship um, of assumption to structure decision-making. And so the first thing I did was what, what was given to that term, uh, just make me a list. If I, if I just know how to help you, I will help. And so I did that for Seth. I, I made him the list of all lists that you both know about because you've read Fair Play. But for those who don't, uh, I spent nine months with an Excel spreadsheet because at the end of the day, um, I do I do love spreadsheets. I'm a lawyer <laughs> that works with highly complex families. I use a lot of Asana and Trello uh, so again, men, I will say, do appreciate that level of rigor and sophistication, especially men who yes. have been coaches and understand systems, coaches and military men who are in the military really appreciate that, that rigor. But in the beginning, it started just with that assumption that's actually wrong, which is that men will help if they just have a list. And so I created something called the should I do spreadsheet that was ultimately created over nine months before social media. So you can imagine how hard it was. It's called the snowball research wow. effect to actually get enough data that's representative of the U.S. So I look for the U.S. census and try to get representative samples 
and got to 98 tabs on an Excel spreadsheet. So if you can picture the bottom, picture 98 tabs and ultimately 2,000 items of work that women um, ultimately in 16 countries were telling me they were doing that was invisible to their partners. I sent set that list, Christian and Brian, um, with no context, just a can't wait to discuss, right? And that that conversation did not go like I planned. It was a disaster. I get I give Seth this amazing spreadsheet I'd work in. And so in a way, it almost reminds me of the flowers. Because I come home with a spreadsheet, like, here you go, here's my gift to you. And it's a it will tell you everything I need help with. And Seth just responded with an early pixelated version of the monkey emoji of the monkey that was covering its eyes. Um, I don't want to see this, like whatever this thing is that you're sending to me. And I think when I got the see no evil monkey emoji, um, other women who had seen my spreadsheet were, were reaching out to me and saying things to me like, oh my God, Eve, I received this should I do spreadsheet? I've never seen anything like it. And I just want to let you know that I'm not staying in my marriage. So sometimes you have to talk about what fails before you could talk about what succeeds. What fails is unleashing consciousness without a solution. And this spreadsheet, this list, which so many men had said to me, if I just had a list, I could do better, was actually not working. It was actually making relationships worse. So I'm going to retire the notion that lists alone will will change your relationship. If you use the fair play cards like a list, they will also fail you. So instead, what I'm going to tell you both, and we'll talk about this because, again, you're from more familiar than probably your listeners are with the system. But the secret formula that fair play became was not a list. What ultimately worked was when I said to myself, I don't want to divorce Seth, uh, especially after this list didn't work. I want to become my own client. And so there was this really funny ad in the 80s and 90s in New York City. It was called the Hair Club for Men. And there was a guy who said, I'm not just the owner of the Hair Club for Men. I'm the first client. And he would take off his like toupee and show that he was in the Hair Club for Men. So I'm like the Hair Club for Men. I became my first client and I started to practice what I was teaching in my day job. So my day job is I'm an organizational management specialist that works for families that look like the HBO show Succession. And yes, you should feel bad for me. Those clients are pain in the ass. But what I do for those organizations is I bring some grace and humor and generosity to really, really difficult family situations. So I figured if I could do it for the most fucked up organizations in the world, Couldn't I do it for my home organization? And so I scrapped the list and instead I put up in a whiteboard for myself. What if we treated the home as our most important organization? What if we treated our home as our most important organization? And then I listed the secret formula. So you asked me what fair play is. I wrote the formula of success that I was telling my families for a decade. To have a successful organization, especially if it's a family, you need three things, boundaries, systems, and communication. So ultimately, that's what fair play is. Yes. Fair play is a secret formula to get you to three things. It's to get you to boundaries, systems, and communication. And you guys can guess what I started with first, because what's the easiest of all three of those things? Well, I would assume systems, but I'm probably wrong. Yes, am I right? Yes, am I right? Exactly. No, you're right. Yeah, of course. Of course. So ultimately, it started as a system where I was able to take the data from the shit I do spreadsheet and start to put it into an organizational system that is not rocket science, as you both know. It is the exact thing we do with our workplace where I'm not going to work for you, Brian, if I come into your office and say, hey, what should I be doing today? I'm just going to wait here till you tell me what to do. It's based on things that men can really understand. It's based on an ownership mindset. That's all it is. 
I took the, should I do spreadsheet? I took every task in that spreadsheet. And I started to explain what it would take to own, to be a partner instead of a helper, just like the workplace where you own your responsibilities. And even my Aunt Marion's Mahjong group, Christian and Brian, had more clearly defined expectations. Even in the Mahjong groups, if you don't bring snacks twice, you're out of the group. Like everybody understands expectations around ownership and responsibility. So once I put it in those terms, I started to get early adopters. Like I said, men who understood systems, they don't put a point guard in for a center unless it's like LeBron James or like men who were in the military who understood the power of systems. And that's where Fair Play started. It started as an ownership mindset based on a system that we use basically everywhere else, which is ownership and not and not helper, helpership. Oh, hold on. I've, I've got somebody that wants to say hello. It's my wife, Hope. <laughs> Hi, Hope. So nice to meet you. Oh, my gosh. We love you. We, oh, you and Brian I are like really changing really. the world. No, you are for sure changing the world. Thank you for all you are doing. This is awesome. Well, Hope, stay with us. Yes, big hugs. Okay, good. <laughs> Thanks, babe. And I for hope. our listeners, that was that was my wife. And she can oh, attest to it. I was, telling, I was telling her how oh. shitty of a husband I was. Oh, really? Yeah, I was being honest. <laughs> no, not at all. He does everything, thankfully. Nice. Oh, we love. Thanks, babe. The evolution is the key, right? That's That's what I love so much about, Brian, your story is that you know, this is a practice and we'll, we'll talk about that. But that, that I just wanted to explain that ultimately when people ask what fair play is, it's a it's it's basically inputs. Um, it's 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 tools and inputs to get you to the idea of boundaries, systems and communication in your home organization. And and for our listeners, um, the let me give you an example of how like I've applied this in in our marriage because you know it it obviously wasn't easy um because as as Eve was saying it's not just systems it's communication and boundaries and um one of the things that I neglected to do initially and 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 I have, I figured it out pretty quickly was you know give my wife grace when she was letting go of something and I was starting to do it because naturally she's looking over my shoulder because she's done yes. it for 20 years and you know I had to, you know, recognize that of course she's going to do it. And she had to recognize that, you know, there's gotta be a way that we can do this where I realize that you own the task. I'm not going to be looking over your shoulder. And um recently I noticed that, you know, kind of she one of the things she held on to was laundry. And I using the fair play cards, and I know that, you know, for our listeners, um, you can't see them, but I but I'm showing them in the video because we have a video portion of this you know, we were going back and forth on, you know, kind of how to initially divide this up. But I thought to myself, I watch football on Sundays. Why is my wife doing laundry when I can do the laundry mm, while I watch football? This I love is, it. I mean, why not do that? So, you know, the first step was like, I'll take it. Well, you know, for the listeners out there, I'm not, I want to, again, stress, I'm not perfect. I'm the kind of guy that throws in like a doormat with a suit in the washer and think <laughs> that's fun. So I did not know what I was doing whatsoever. I'd never done the laundry except for in college when I, nobody has nice clothes. So <laughs> um, to Eve system with spreadsheets, I know it's probably hard to see up. Oh, you can't see it. I'll post it when we post this on our blog. Um, oh, there we go. Um, so my wife is in finance and she lives on spreadsheets. She creates this spreadsheet to tell me, you know, like, nice clothes, workout clothes. She breaks them all into these segments and tells me, what is it that you do with each of these sets of clothes? Like the spin cycle, the laundry detergent and all these things Love I didn't it. even know existed. So I just follow her spreadsheet. I own the laundry. And like now all of a sudden it's like her Sundays are free. And I'm, it's not like I'm doing that much more. I'm just folding laundry while I'm watching football. And so that's an example of where we talked about it. We have boundaries now. And there's a system in place that originated from the fair play cards. My God, can I just cry and how amazing that is and how much I love hope for creating a laundry system spreadsheet. I mean, she's a woman <laughs> after my own heart. And I, I, I don't actually ever tell the story. And I know, Christian, I want to let you speak too about your experience. But I want to just, it reminded me of a story that I heard um, during COVID that, again, I don't 
really write or talk about that much because it's, you know, I'm, I was collecting data for the documentary. At this point, um, we ended up interviewed over 110 couples as for casting for our documentary during the pandemic to see how what was happening with fair play couples versus non-fair play couples. Spoiler mm-hmm. alert, the fair play couples were doing a lot better during the pandemic because they had boundary systems and communication. Um, or they at least understood that they were working towards something as opposed to just, again, the man with the dog where they were, you know, it was about to take a piss in the rug every night. So, um, but this one couple, Amy and Richard, um, they, it, it was interesting because the fair play cards, the system part, again, is not rocket science. There's a hundred cards uh, that were, again, bi- extrapolated from the should I do spreadsheet of those hundred cards. The goal is not 50, 50. That's why I think it has become very adaptable for situations, especially men on the road. I have a lot of pilots using it. Um, again, men in the military who don't, can't do 50, 50, but they do have things that they own. So the goal is maybe you own one card of a hundred, maybe you own 40 cards, maybe it's like Brian, where he started off owning maybe two cards in 20 years ago, and now he owns the majority of the cards. It's, a, it's, a, it's just like you redeal based on your family circumstance. But there was this couple. And th- so this guy, Richard, tells me, that, so of the 100 cards, what he noted, and there's four suits. There's the home suit, the out suit, the magic, and caregiving. Typically, we, we set it up that way because men were very helpful in the uh, home suit. So that's sort of like things like, you know, trash, but I wasn't seeing a lot of movement in the caregiving suit, which is like making, keeping track of vaccines, knowing which, which, when the kids need to go to the orthodontist, you know, being the one to take the kid home when they're sick. So Richard says to me, he was doing great on things like laundry, um, but he realized he didn't have any magic cards, which are these, these more esoteric cards like gifts emotional labor, like in-law management. So he decides to take the magical beings card, which is in many homes, Santa, Tooth Fairy. I don't know, there's even Lucky Leprechaun. I heard a lot, a lot of magical beings out there based on your culture. So what Richard says to me during the pandemic was that similar to what you said, Brian, that there was a transition point where he took on this card of being the Tooth Fairy but it was a little bit in in flux. So he forgot to be the tooth fairy. The tooth fairy didn't come for his daughter. It was her second tooth. And as you can imagine, there was a lot of distress for this young girl when the tooth fairy did not show up. So what I like about the story is it's so small because what Amy said was that before fair play, this is what would have happened. She would have gotten really verbal assassin in her communication and said, you fucking ruined our child's life. Like, you, th- I can't rely on you. They're never going to recover. The magic is gone, right? And and Richard said he would have blamed Amy for not reminding him to put the dollar under the pillow. That was sort of their dynamic. Now he says to me, all he did was one thing that changed the entire scenario that, again, Fair Play t- was able to teach him to do, which is to say, my bad. I fucked up. I own this card and I did not do what I had to do. Once he said that, Amy said to me, she completely backed off. She said, I can't believe he actually didn't blame me for not reminding him. Like he took ownership of his mistake. We all make mistakes. So she stays quiet. And then he tells me that he, part of the premise of owning something, right, is you carry through your mistake. So in front of his daughter, before she went to school, he emailed toothfairy at gmail.com or before she went off to play or something. Later on in the day, he gets a response from toothfairy at gmail.com, which he was not expecting that said, you know, we're, we're backed up on teeth due to the supply chain issues or the pandemic. He reads it to his little daughter. She understands only that you get double the money if the tooth fairy is late. And then the tooth fairy that came that night and brought her double the money. And that was it. It's a small story, but there's nothing to me that illustrates similar to what Brian was saying about the laundry. I love that story because it shows the evolution of a marriage in fair play terms where it's super small, but you can tell that ultimately that couple is going to be in a very different place. It also gave the the child uh, an accountability 
you know, officer moment there too, because next time, you know, next tooth, uh, she loses, you know, if it's late, okay, it's just <laughs> a $2 tooth, my friends. Um, that has some knock on effects there too. Beautiful. I actually think that's important because you're right. I don't, I don't think we talk enough about what the children see in this. If you have children at home that, when you are doing this for your children, you are investing in an entire different dynamic yeah. for your children. And I think that we forget that this is not just chores and housework. This is an investment in how your children see um, your relationship. And I remember one woman saying to me, you know what? She was really okay doing it all. But what she realized was she was not okay having her daughters watch her do it all. And she really broke down over that. And I think there's something really beautiful in breaking the cycle, the generational cycle, we talk about, there's so many books now about the problem with boys and blaming men for the situation they got into. And I don't believe any of that. I think the the hardest thing ever for men, besides being only identified as a breadwinner, for me, it was watching men say to me, while it was hard for women to say, to hear that they were dying and getting sick under the mental load. What was even harder for me was listening to men say that they actually don't have a role in their home. Because yeah. when you think about that in the workplace, that's called psychological safety. If you don't know your role at work, it, it, it's associated with a lot of anxiety, depression, wanting to leave that company. And so that's why this term psychological safety is sort of exploded. I was hearing from men that there was not a lot of psychological safety in the home, that yes, I've tried to help, but I can't do anything right. Once I put that mat in with the suit, my wife never let me try to do the laundry again. And instead there's a lot of huffing and puffing and resentment, but I'm, I'm locked out of carrying through my mistake of trying again. And that made me really, really sad for men. Hey there, podcast fam. We'd love to hear from you. Please take this moment to rate and subscribe to our podcast. Your feedback fuels our passion to bring you more engaging content. And please text this episode to your friends. It's your support that can help us grow. Now back to the show. Say on the flip side, you know, the system that you've developed and, and popularized helps transform that conversation to a much more productive one uh, that, you know, allows both you know, members of, of relationships to carry forward and move forward on the, on the spectrum. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, if you're not going to be allowed the space to carry through a mistake, then in that situation, Richard would never have been the tooth fairy ever again. Right. The, the, the beauty of, of um, understanding systems is that when you have systems in place, it actually leads you to the most two important things an organization can have, which are accountability and trust. So if you go back to that tooth fairy example, the second that in his communication style, Richard took accountability for fucking up over the tooth fairy, all of a sudden Amy could trust him. There's something really important about that relationship between accountability and trust. Once you start blaming somebody else for your mistake, then usually the trust erodes. That's what I see. One of the things that occurred to me as, as I was evolving and uh, reading your book, reading uh, Dr. Kate Mangino's book, um, Equal Partners, was that when a, a spouse, in, in my case, it was my wife, owned most of the responsibilities at home, it was just easier for her to say, I got it. So if I were to reach out and say, what can I do to help in a genuine way, mm -hmm. in the same way a manager doesn't want to de do somebody else's job yes. because it takes more time for them to explain it than to do it themselves, yes, yes. my wife would just say to me, I got it. So naturally, I would be like, sweet. And that, that creates resentment because she can't communicate the complexities behind the, the invisible labor to, let's just say, cook which I know Christian's going to talk about here in a second and everything that's required around that from the grocery shopping to cleaning up afterwards. And it's, it was easier for her to say, I got it. And for me, it was like, okay, no problem. And now, and now I don't understand why she resents me because I've never been in her position. I've never 
owned the responsibility of, of managing a home, or at least just enough of a responsibility to recognize why she would tell me that. Can I tell you something why that's so important too? I just want to say one more thing, why it's not your your fault out there. I want to say this like Goodwill hunting style. I don't know if you if you remember that movie, but oh, what a the great most movie. The best, the best, the best part of that movie is when Robin Williams just looks at Matt Damon and says, it's "Are you going to shake fault. me even tell me it's not your fault?" It's is not that, your fault. Is, am I Matt Damon that right now? I, I want all men to be Matt Damon in the situation. It is not your fault, and I think that's why it's so important because. I wish it was just a system. If it was just as easy as a system, someone else would have done this work. They wouldn't have devoted their life to a fair play movement because I could just hand out the cards and just say, go for it, right? But the reason yeah. why I said earlier, it has to be three things is because ultimately the boundaries lead to terrible communication. So what do I mean by that? Why it's not your fault is because society has conditioned men to to treat their time differently to protect you from from what we've ultimately thought of as shitty crappy work but ultimately is our humanity like the tooth fairy like picking up a sick kid from school and then the other thing that no one talks about is when you introduce a child to a relationship even the most fair men in the world married to women society starts to bang and, and push you into more traditional lines of thinking than you probably ever would have yourself. And on top of that, you add 40 cards. There are 60 cards that apply to people for a home organization without kids. You add 40, yeah. 40 more cards when a child comes. Nobody is saying to you before you have kids, have you talked about the exponential workload that's going to increase? They will say to you, have you thought about um, the registry for your random uh, car seat? They'll say to you, have you like banked your cord blood? But no one is actually saying to you, you're adding 40 additional cards, which is about 50%. I'll say, let's just say it's about 50% yeah. more labor to your plates. How are you going to handle this labor? And so I think that's why it is really a system that has been set up to fail. And if you're if you're a husband out there who's also a lead caregiver or close to it, uh, we recommend our, our good friend uh, Paul Sullivan from the Company of Dads. Yes, Check out his website. Yes. He's an excellent place to turn for for resources. Um, he he is immensely successful, and uh, you know he has has turned his passion toward helping other lead caregivers um, be the best that they can be. Uh, I before we started, Christian and I were talking about. Both of us are love for for cooking, um, and I know mm. Christian. As a result of that conversation, had a had a question. Yeah, I love to cook, and it's a little. There's a wrinkle in it too, because I love to cook, but I hate going to the grocery store. Absolutely abhor it. Uh, I there's like no worse place for me than the grocery store. First, I don't know why. I maybe I'm. Uh, I hear you. I agree. Yeah, we're we're misanthropes or something. I, I don't know. I, just, I get there and there's like too many people. I'm freaking out. I, yeah. I, people are going the wrong direction with the carts. Come on. There's a clear system. You know, where there's it a feels direction. Very, right. It feels very inefficient grocery store, as I will say. For sure. Um, so, so there's a, a slight wrinkle here. Like I am by and large taking care of almost all, if not all of the cooking. Um, but Chelsea orders groceries. Uh, you that's know, fine. With, with, uh, that's totally fine. Um, I love that, by the way. How, uh, say uh, say more about that. That's important because Christians outsource grocery shopping. Before no, Christian this gets is to the, the thing. question. This is the thing. This is important. So we, yes. Well, this is why I want to be very clear that there is a reason that Fair Play took from 2011 to 2019 to be released into the world. We, I needed the most amount of data possible of every scenario, including those polyamorous men who, who are sharing tasks with two women, um, to understand how people did the operations of their home. So Christian, grocery shopping, groceries is a separate card than meals. So 100% groceries and meals are often done by a different person. And even tidying up is a separate card. 
because typically the person who cooks is not the person who's tidying up. You can take all three of those cards, but I don't want you to think cooking and meals requires you to also take on the grocery card and the tidying up card. You can, but ultimately, usually the person who does the cooking is not going to the grocery store or tidying up. Those cards are typically separate because the labor of the cooking and so it's very important though, because if you are the chef, what you don't want is you don't want your ingredients not to be there. So if you are going to have the grocery card holder be somebody different than you, it does require a Sunday check-in or some time when emotion is low and cognition is high, not to say you forgot the blueberries, but to say in advance, I'm meal prepping for this week. I'm going to be cooking this when you grocery shop or Instacart or whatever you do. Here are the things I need this week. So it just requires a little yep. bit more advanced planning if the groceries card holder is not the person who's in charge of meals. And not only that, we have lots of families where dinner is, a, is, is the meal of chefs, somebody who feels like there's more creativity in dinner. Typically, that's called meals dinner. And that's we, there's weekday dinners and then there's weekend meals. Often that person who likes to cook, I see in my data, is taking on the nighttime meals. That does not mean that person also has to take on the meal card for school lunches or breakfast. Typically, I see those cards broken up where the person who does not like to cook will take breakfast because that's an easier lift. It's like a Chobani yogurt, you know, on the way to school or like a, a zone bar or something. So, so that I just want to be very clear that those are separate cards in the fair play system for a reason. Yeah. Christian, that, that, that was a sense. setup. That was a setup. <laughs> Here, here's why I did this to you because Christian is, is always hard on himself and he's brought up to me that hit that, that the groceries are ordered, that they don't go get them. And he thinks that's bad. And we, I wanted to make sure that, that Eve, you said amazing. something and I wanted to yes. point out if you can outsource a task, do it. If you have the means, if you have the financial means to outsource a task, to get time back, do it. And Christian's, Christian's doing it. Um, whereas, Absolutely. Like if, Absolutely. And but if can you I just say one more thing about outsourcing? I want to just say one thing about outsourcing. The thing that hurt so many women, though, was um, that they had men who made more money than them say to them, if you're so overwhelmed, just get help. I'm happy to pay for help. Again, it comes from such a good place for men. So that's why I'm saying it's back to goodwill hunting. It's not your fault. But that's why there, I said earlier, there are different suits in the fair play system. When you say that to a partner, if you're so overwhelmed, just get help. Unfortunately, they are still left with 50 cards, five zero in the system that are not outsourceable from my data. Like, and so what do I mean by that? There's a card called. Grooming, as much as you love Alexia, your nanny, typically she's not taking your child to get a haircut. It just doesn't work that way. As much as you love Alexia, she's not the one deciding whether your child's adenoids are going to be taken out. So that's why outsourcing 100%, yes, as long as you're still the card owner. But I don't want us, the men on the first time listeners to say, well, Hey, I said that to my partner. If you're just so overwhelmed, get help. And she <laughs> threw a, you know, a, a rag at my face. So I want to understand that's an important nuance. So I hope that is clear in that nuance. <laughs> Outsource within reason. Yes. Yes, uh, exactly. Yes. Or as they would say in another famous line from Goodwill hunting, how do you like them apples? Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's what and the guy from you, Amazon. Christian, so exactly. According to you, Christian, you're not going to have control over them apples because you are outsourcing them to a, a picker of your apples, but that's fine. <laughs> they may not be the perfect apples, but as long as they don't have brown spots, I'm going to say it's okay for you to get a honey crisp, you know, instead of a Macintosh, you know, once in a while. You know, Eve, I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> There is a reason we're releasing this episode around Valentine's Day. Um, we, we know from research that uh, gifts received on days where you're supposed to receive a gift mean less. And the obligatory like roses and chocolates, they really don't mean much at all. 
Um, and what, what we want to portray to our listeners is that if you really want to do something that's thoughtful, that can really improve your relationship, but provide genuine happiness for, for your partner, not just in the moment they receive it, but also in the years that follow, that we, we recommend um, diving into looking at purchasing the fair play system. Mm. And I know this, you probably, if you've listened to our, our podcast, you've never heard us say, you should purchase this. That's just not <laughs> something that we typically do. But, but please trust us in understanding that you know, either the documentary, the book, the cards, how that can benefit um, you know, couples, not just in that moment on Valentine's Day, um, but in, in all of the years that, that follow. And trust me, as somebody who's gone through it, um, you will appreciate it as much as your, your, your wife. Um, where, where is it that uh, listeners can learn more about Fair Play and, and perhaps purchase some of those project, uh, products? Yes, and we are uh, the Fair Play Policy Institute. We're, we've evolved into a nonprofit. This is now a movement. So again, I know there's finances are tight. And even if you don't want to buy the book, we have a lot of free resources on fairplay.com. Um, you can always follow Fair Play Life. It's sort of a funny Instagram account that, you know, sort of makes fun of these old dynamics. Um, so those are great places. And then in our like last minute together, I thought since it's Valentine's Day, maybe we can give an assignment, whether you go online or get the cards. Uh, I thought there could be a fun Valentine's Day assignment. You don't have, I would not recommend on your first Valentine's Day, if you're hearing this for the first time, sitting down with all the fair play cards. But I was thinking um, if I could just play um, a little, not even a homework assignment, I'll say it's a game. What you, I would like for you to do, if, you've, if this is the first time you've ever heard fair play, this is what I'd like for you to do at your Valentine's Day date, table, walk. I want you to go and get the fair play cards, just randomly shuffle them or go online, pick one. And I want you to ask your partner a story of their childhood. So I'm going to, let's model it. So who wants to be my volunteer, Brian, Christian? I I will be your volunteer. And a matter of fact, I have a And of course, I'm going to shuffle this this one. Okay. I I love that. I, I, well, let me, let me, I'm going to, shuffle and i'm just gonna pick literally a random one like let's just just uh, keep going i'm just i'm just like don't make it health insurance eve please don't make it health insurance tell me when to stop Stop. tell me when to stop stop Stop. okay all right let's see what we got okay what is this let's see let's pull it off the top completely random of the cards of the hundred let's see what we picked we picked ooh, informal education kids Okay, so I'm going to explain what this card means. And this is the, what I want the beautiful, hopefully, the exercise to be on Valentine's Day. So, Brian, we're, if, I'm, if I'm Hope and you're Brian and this is, or you're Christian, their partner, or anybody listening, you're going to pick any random card. So I picked informal education kids. So the only thing I want you to do on this Valentine's Day is I want a story. That's it. From each other. Tell me a story about anything that you learned as a child that wasn't in school. So give me an example. An example would be, do you remember who taught you to ride a bike or tie your shoes? Can you give me a story about either one of those? Do you remember learning to ride a bike or do you remember learning to tie your shoes? Uh, Yes, I do. And sorry, you're giving me chills up my back because the way that you are structuring this is starting with something just super positive and happy and you're helping each other understand the importance of tackling these tasks. It's not just something that you do for the house to run, but it's something that becomes memories in a family. It's our humanity. So that's why I want to hear, do you give us in our one minute left together? Can you tell us, end us on a memory, a memory of, like I said, what, what do you remember about learning to ride a bike or tying your shoe, just one memory that you can give us. My dad actually talks about this quite a bit. He's, he's a cyclist. He cycled across America twice. He took my son one year across America to raise money for MS. And that was, that was a big deal to him. It was a, it was a habit for him. And he said, that I used to, and I, I, I remembered this, not obviously as vividly as him, but there was um, a seat in the back. 
And he said that oh. once he got home from work, mm -hmm. I would just say, bikey ride, bikey ride. And mm -hmm. I would just every day, that was the routine. That's what we did. And I, I just remember like the trees mm -hmm. that were up high and the cul-de-sac where he would turn around. Um, and then the only, the only thing that I remember beyond that is just the feeling of being, you know, like happy and love. Oh my God. I mean, really, can you make us cry in like 20 seconds? I will say that I, 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 in our entire hour, I feel like in that literally 30 second exercise, I know you so much better. I mean, I know a lot about your father now. I know that he was in your life, that you weren't a product of a single mom. I know that, uh, you were on a bike early. Um, I know that maybe, you know, your partner this is where people have clashes, something that mattered to them, like maybe bike riding. The other person never had any experience with it at all. And so they're wondering why you care so much about something. So I just love that. We just pulled that randomly out of nowhere. But I love that it was that one because who knew that your father had this connection to bikes and we, we pulled the bike card. So may, this is in honor of your father. So let's just shout out to your dad and his amazing bike rides for you when you were young. Thank you, Eve. You, you're making such a big difference for so many people. And it was an honor to have you on today. Um, and I and my wife obviously greatly appreciates <laughs> um, you. So so from you know bottom of my heart, uh, I, I thank you for joining. I was just going to wish uh, our dear listeners a happy Valentine's Day uh, and hope that our session today with Eve is helpful. I know it was for me and I know it was for Brian. Thank you, Eve. You rock. Oh, happy Valentine's Day, everyone. A special thanks to our guest and, of course, to all of our listeners. Don't forget to click subscribe wherever you download your podcast, give us a rating, and share the Modern Husbands podcast with others. Doing so goes a long way in growing our reach. And join your fellow Modern Husbands and have links to our podcasts, articles, and other resources to manage money in the home as a team sent to your inbox every two weeks by subscribing to our newsletter at modernhusbands.com. Until next time, be well.